Thanks for the invite to, uh, to come across here. And I've got to say how much better it is to be speaking to you in person rather than from uh, in front of a video camera and then bedside. I was uh, one day out of uh, a hospital uh, operation. So I discovered um, in 2011, I have always had, got very excited about finding exotic pathogens killing trees. And I, I, um, I get really excited. And then I had a the situation where I had my own pathologist getting really excited about an exotic pathogen in my hip. So <coughs> if I suddenly, uh, uh, if I start to show a bit too much enthusiasm, just remind me. <laughs> There's a human dimension to this. Um, and I, so, uh, and it's, I guess it's ironic that my opening slide on managing the health of plantation eucalypt shows a pretty poorly managed uh, eucalypt plantation, but I'll get to that at the end. I'll go for the arrows. So just uh, a quick outline of what I'm going to cover. And it is, uh, I've got to point out that our rainfall cutoff in our eucalypt plantations is 800 millimetres. So it's not about <laughs> the, the pest and disease threats in the estate that I'm talking about. It is only peripherally of uh, interest in the dryland estate. But I think what I want to try and get across is the process of management rather than the actual threats themselves, because I think there's a lot of commonalities. Um, so looking at the, uh, the status of our plantation estate in Tasmania, um, the main pest threats and how our approach we take to managing those, and then at the end some looking forward. So just very briefly, in 2011 when I last spoke, um, you can see Forestry Tasmania's plantation estate in that um, bar chart below. Um, we just got to the end of a major expansion phase, so we just come to the end of a period where most of the pest threats we were concerned about were establishment and early, estab early rotation pests. And we've moved into a period now where most of the pest threats we're concerned with are those mid-rotation and late rotations, and particularly the pulpwood plantations, which are mostly uh, the privately owned ones, they're coming into that, making that transition from first to second rotation. Most of the estate is nitens in Tasmania, almost exclusively so in the pulpwood plantations. In the uh, forestry Tasmania's estate, it's about 80-20, with the idea that we want to try and progressively move more towards uh, globulus, replacing nitens on areas where it's um, suitable for it. The other thing is that since I last spoke, the plantation, the, the ownership of the plantation estate has finally settled down. It was in a period of great up turmoil through the late noughties through to about 2014-15 with the collapse of the MIS. Uh, most of the plantations, privately owned plantations, were without, they were in the hands of receivers for four or five years and the management they received during that period was less than ideal. But we've come out of that and we've got a, I guess, going into a new phase of active management and very, a lot of enthusiasm about the prospects of the, the uh, plantation industry in Tasmania. Now the main pest threats, uh, this is based on, um, I haven't re-evaluated this over the last couple of years, but uh, for the first 10 years of our health surveillance program, just looking at the pest damage we were mostly seeing. So you can see the two standouts, browsing mammals and chrysomelids, and then a whole range of uh, um, pests and uh, some uh, other abiotic problems, which were most commonly reported in our plantation estate. This is something that I, I found really, really informative and useful, it was understanding the estate you're working with. So looking at this is just looking at the climate, map, mapping our plantation estate into a climate zone, so effective rainfall on the y-axis and uh, minimum temperature on the x-axis. And each of those cells spans a, a range of, of those, the samples a range of that climate. And we're just looking at the proportion of the expected yield of the plantation estate in each of those climate zones. So you can see clearly which part of the climate range of the plantation estate are most important for productivity. So these are, these are darker blue regions 
um, where most of our expectations are for future yields. The areas around the periphery, less so. So if you then start to overlay some of these pests and diseases on that estate, you can start to see which pest threats coincide with our greatest expectation of yield. So we do this as a this is for severe defoliation by leaf beetles and it pretty much coincides with the, those parts of the estate where we have the highest expectations for future yields. So they're going to be the ones that are going to have the greatest, a big impact on our plantation productivity. More so even with uh, browsing mammals, they completely coincide with our most productive part of the estate. <coughs> so for that reason, those two pests that are the most prevalently, the most regularly encountered from our health surveillance, and they coincide with our, those parts of our plantation estate that we have our greatest expectation on, are the two most important pests for us to get the management right. So for the first next section, I'll talk about the pest management for those two pests, and then I'll go into some of the other ones after that. So. That's pretty much, our, the, I guess, the first snippet of um, a system, system, systematic approach is the decision whether we go for pest-specific management and proactive management or more reactive management through health surveillance. And you can see that's our, how we break it up. So those really commonly encountered ones that are in the most important parts of the estate are ones where we have pest-specific management and then we reactive management to detection for the less common ones. Um, really briefly on browsing mammals, I don't really want to spend too much time on that. Um, IPM, Integrated Pest Management, a word often bandied around. Not much, you know, there's a lot of um, various people have different views on what IPM really is, but they, they use the term nonetheless without thinking about too much of it is. And it's using integrated approaches to management. And the integration here is a combination of long lethal tactics particularly these seedling stockings, which just provide a physical protection to the young seedlings, and the culling, the shooting in shooting or trapping in the case. We used to use 1080. We no longer use that. We haven't used that since 2005. Culling by shooting and trapping is really expensive. So we want to try and only do so much as we need to. So regular monitoring. So we, met, we monitor seedling height, the red line, and we also monitor the amount of browsing damage on the seedlings around the perimeter of the plantation and that triggers culling operations at various points. Um, that we really got, got to a, you know, we're just getting good at doing that. It, we used to spend about $100 a hectare on using 1080. Cost for browsing went up to about $500 a hectare and we're starting to ease it down because there was a, there was a concern that shooting was, uh, it was a hysteresis. There was a time before the effects of shooting started to take, a, take hold on reducing the damage, whereas 1080 they thought was more immediate. So there was a perceptual thing there that they tended to be very conservative in the, the way they used to shoot. So trying to get the field people to take more notice of the monitoring results and adjust their shooting accordingly was a big part of doing that. And we were just starting to see the, the uh, effects of that. And then we had... Uh, the financial crisis and uh, the effects of that were sort of hidden by the cost of the threat of, well, the threat of bankruptcy just so minimising expenditure at all costs. So uh, um, we'll have to review that again in the future when that gets ramped up again. The other pest is the leaf beetle. Now this was a, a pet, we've known a long, long time that our successful plantation management in Tasmania would be contingent upon being able to manage this pest. So, our initial attempts at plantation establishment were based on the, the local ash species, Eucalyptus regnans and Delicatensis particularly, completely hammered by these beetles. The main species we were concerned about was Peropsis turna by maculata, it's an, in, exo, uh, sorry, an endemic in Tasmania. And a lot of the early work <coughs> research through the 70s through to the 90s was about understanding the biology of that beetle and its natural enemies sufficiently that we could manage it in a plantation environment. And it was the first, this was the, 
the IPM, the Integrated Pest Management, originally developed for the leaf beetle back in uh, the late 90s. Um, and it all involved a knowledge of the life history from uh, the emergence of the adults from overwintering through laying eggs and then the four larval instars to pupation and then the, the next generation adults and knowing when they appeared, when most of the natural enemies were active, so the predators were particularly important and they were most active in the egg and early larval instars, when most of the larval damage was happening in the later instars. So knowing those snippets of information, we could see that we could need, if we needed to know the size of the population and whether we needed to control it or not, we needed to do our monitoring early around about the egg population stage, then we needed to get the controls done before it got into that second, a third and fourth instar larval stage. So we had to make our decision of whether we needed to control or not in that initial period. <coughs> and the initial IPM back in the late 90s, early 2000s, was pretty subjective in terms of what the thresholds of control were. We didn't have good information on just what level of population we needed to control to avoid serious damage. So that was the first, I guess, the first area of improvement. And I'll also say the, um, the consideration at that time was that most of the th threat was to the younger plantations. So the IPM was really only applied during those first four or five years. So between ages four and six, two and six, sorry, were the, the main aims, ages targeted. So that was the, you know, I'll, I just covered that, I should have pressed the next slide. So it was a, a, the, the key thing there that was the control decision, it was a qualitative control decision. Then um, we had a really smart biometrician before Lewis, <laughs> uh, Steve Candy, he did his uh, PhD thesis look, developing an economic injury model for eucalyptus leaf beetle. Um, he finished that in uh, 2000, did a lot of work on establishing the relationship between the size of an egg population and the amount of defoliation that population would do. So we could come up with a, an economic injury model that would be based on a control decision based on the egg population rather than the damage. So that was put in place in the, the early 2000s, didn't change the target range, the plantations were two to six years old and we had this economic injury level which basically drove our control decisions. So we'd monitor the populations, we would test to see whether those populations were above our threshold and if they were we would take steps to initiate control. Which was all at this stage um, alpha cyphermethrin. A lot of work on non uh, using alternatives to alpha cyphermethrin, largely unsuccessful so far, but and I won't dwell too much on those. What we did find with our surveillance as we moved into our, our plantation state, moved into older age classes, mid-rotation stage, we started to see a lot of plantations looking like this. They're developing very chronic thin, thinning of the crowns. And coinciding with that, we were seeing massive reductions in uh, growth rate. So, you know, talking about 90 to 95% reduction in uh, annual in volume increments uh, associated with um, year to year high <coughs> defoliation levels. So that was damage that was developing in plantations older than the range we were targeting in our IPM. <coughs> so that triggered a little bit of uh, angst and the desire to understand what was going on. The first thing we did was uh, we had a, an honours student who did a really nice study to try and understand what attributes of landscape, climate and the plantation itself could be associated with a high, high likelihood of a population, above threshold population developing in that plantation. We were spending an enormous amount of effort monitoring, so we're monitoring 20 to 25,000 hectares of plantations. We're monitoring those fortnightly through the summer, so it's a massive monitoring effort. So if we could reduce or focus the area we were monitoring, um, that was going to be a, a really useful outcome. And she found really nice, nicely, I thought, that high altitude, high altitude plantations and plantations that were in, within 10 kilometres of native grasslands, those two parameters appeared in just about every model she attempted to develop, whether she used a combination of climate factors or whatever. Those two parameters were 
consistently the top two ranked predictors of the high likelihood of above threshold populations. So using that, we then developed, um, we rated all of our plantations according to those two attributes as a, a low risk where neither of those conditions were satisfied, a moderate risk if one or other of the conditions were satisfied and high risk if they both were. So we moved to a, a risk-based delineation of our estate. The other thing we did, we started to see this chronic thin crown developing mid-rotation. At the same time, we also got a, a really wet summer and we had a massive outbreak of uh, fungal leaf disease and there were two, we were tr struggling to separate, is this one or the other causing this? So we did some intensive shoot monitoring to try and understand what role the beetles were having in maintaining that chronic thin crown and found very clearly that uh, the over adults, when they come out of overwintering, um, they're wanting to feed before they lay eggs and they're eating off all the new shoot being produced. Bear in mind that most of the foliage has been already removed, they're uh, carrying thin crowns and as the new leaves are being produced they're pretty much eating that off. So you're not getting any substantive new leaf being carried by the canopies until after Christmas when that feeding stops. Um, so we're, we're not getting any new seasons, you know, missing out on half that new season's growth and that's just maintaining it in that chronic state. And then we we were maintaining these growth impact stop plots. So I showed you those results earlier, that reduction in the current annual increment. The other thing they showed, as soon as those crowns recovered, the growth rates recovered really well too. <clears throat> so that took us to the final adjustment in our IPM. We adjusted our control decision. So we still had the economic injury level, but in those plantations we were trying to get recovery, which had chronic leaching crowns, we were wanting to get, any, we were wanting to avoid any damage by the early beetle populations as well. So we had an ad, beetles present threshold for recovering plantations. The major change was in where we we targeted our monitoring. So we we started in older plantations. We were less concerned with very young plantations, but we extended the range of ages we were monitoring up to age 12. And to reduce, keep the size of the programming contained, we only monitored air plantations that were of medium to high risk of having above threshold populations. We just dropped the low risk plantations out of our estate, our IPM completely. And that was about, that was over 50% of the plantations. So it made a massive difference to the size of the program. It meant we could monitor, we could detect most of the above threshold populations for a much less monitoring effort. So, I'll keep on the integrated part. So I just keep on reminding people what we mean by integrated. And the, the critical thing in the integrated here is in the population monitoring. Once we detect an above threshold population, before we make a spray, we get ready for spraying. But before we actually do a spraying, we do a second monitoring to see, to test whether that population is still above threshold or it hasn't been reduced naturally. And we find typically that about 20% of our above threshold populations decline to below threshold population a size before spraying in that week after initial detection and for a variety of reasons. Natural enemy predators, um, natural predation, but also some extreme, you know, heavy, significant weather events. So heavy rain or heavy wind events dislodging the larvae is another really important um, fact that reducing those populations. And that's, that's worth getting. 20% of your control operations is a significant saving when you're spraying a few thousand hectares. And it's also really good when you're going to FSC and you've got to demonstrate that you're minimising your use of chemicals as much as possible. <coughs> Just recently, we, you know, we're evaluating where we got to with our leaf beetle IPM. We've invested a lot of time and money in it. And I guess we needed to, to sit back and look, was it all worth it? And we've done a financial analysis of this as well as a number of other couple of pests. This is really trying to get we pathologists and entomologists armed with the same language to talk to CEOs and company owners about threats in terms of dollars and cents. So trying to get some financials on the dollars and cents of management and research. So looking at the expenditure, we started very early and we did a lot of expenditure on research until we got the plantation largely established at the end of the, the noughties, but uh, initial research was looking at the conventional IPM, a lot of research in the 2000, you know, mid-90s into the late noughties looking at all softer chemicals. 
and about two thirds of our total expenditure between 1974 and what we predict we will spend on by the end of 2034 was on research. So a big fraction of the total IPM project was on that initial <coughs> research. When we look at the, the cash flow coming from that, um, negative cash flow for a large period and wasn't, didn't get a positive cash flow until the, um, the plantation estate had large been in the ground and we started to get plantations reaching an age where they could be harvested. Once we got to that stage, the benefit cost ratio of management, you know, the monitoring and the control was really good. So we were seeing a very hot, very positive benefit to cost ratio from our management. Now, I just want to talk very briefly toward the end of a couple of the less common <coughs> pests that nonetheless cause severe damage and you might be interested in the autumn gum <coughs> moth and fungal folia diseases. Now, there they are on the, they're the ones that we mainly detect through health surveillance, um, very difficult to predict. We wouldn't want to try and monitor them routinely. We're interested in autumn gum moth. It can periodically outbreak, causing quite severe damage. And Dave DeLittle, from, who's a now retired entomologist, did a really nice study where you can see the spray line. So sprayed, unsprayed, and looking at the growth impact. So it had a massive impact on the growth of these, uh, this night in plantations, and that growth impact was sustained for a long time because a lot of trees were killed. So it's an autumn defoliator. Autumn defoliations generally have a big impact on the survivorship. Um, so the autumn gum off, so I mentioned its long-term impact. It's difficult to predict when and where the outbreaks are going to occur. And so general surveillance is going to be a bit hit and miss. And it's not sufficiently common to justify the expense of going out and doing pest-specific surveillance, targeted surveillance. So it's an ideal candidate for pheromone trapping just to detect when a population's in an area. Um, Paul Walker and Jeff Allen at Ute has did a lot of work to see if they could identify any pheromones that the females released um, that attracted the males. And they, uh, I'm not, I wasn't going to try and put the names of the compounds down. There are two, two compounds that in very precise um, proportions are very attractive to the males. They were field tested, they work, they haven't yet been operationally deployed. The fungal folly diseases, and we're mainly talking about, uh, for those of us that have been around long enough, Microsphrella leaf diseases, for those around the New Zealanders that have been around longer, um, um, Septoria pulcherima, a Peter Gadgill name. Um, two really common ones, most of the damage. You've got both here, um, and the uh, eucalyptus, myrtle rust. The, um, I've caught it nubilosa there, it's actually pseudo-nubilosa. Um, looking at the, we talk about site effects. This is the main, this is just a study looking at where the epidemics of um, this disease have occurred in the past and looking at the frequency of epidemics and trying to model how frequent return epidemics are going to be. And it's very clear that um, up in the Smithton area, um, severe defoliation was very much more likely to occur than up here. So one year in five, you're likely to get conditions suitable for severe, one year in 30 here. So in Tasmania, the milder winters um, allow a stronger overlap between new leaf production and high moisture. Whereas at the bowler in the northeast, those overlapping conditions only occur in abnormally wet summers. So quite different conditions triggering epidemics in those two parts of Tasmania. The other thing we learnt was those severe epidemics, so complete defoliation. It does have a big growth impact, but the growth rates recover quite quickly, so it's a lag effect. Um, so over a 25 year rotation, complete defoliation at year one. Um, it is a slightly longer rotation, but the growth impacts are relatively small and maybe sufficient in globulus for the improvements in wood quality to compensate for that lower that loss for that first year or two of growth. Now, everyone's been waiting for this, the um, myrtle rust. Um, in Tasmania, Brad Potts and, uh, they teamed up with a few of us to screen all the Tasmanian eucalypt species um, for susceptibility. We have two so strongly susceptible response, Regnans from northern Tasmania, Porciflora, very susceptible. 
but quite a lot of variation. So there's globulus from a hypersensitive reaction right through to a susceptible reaction. So the aim was to see, screen all 30 species with plus two subspecies, 85 provenances in all, and uh, a thousand parent trees provided the, the seed lots that were screened. That was all done up at the University of New South Wales. Um, this was the result. And this is just looking at the proportion of uh, um, susceptible responses. So those rated a four or five. And you can see these are the most resistant species through to the most susceptible species. And you can see very clearly in this that the subgenus eucalyptus, the formal subgenus eucalyptus, dominates the susceptible response, whereas the Cynthia myrtus dominates the resistant response. So the Cynthia myrtus has more resistance to myrtle rust than uh, the eucalyptus. The other thing is susceptibility is just one thing, the conditions have got to be right. And we've got globulus planted in Uruguay and we know when they, they got Microsphere or Teratosphere there and they had an epidemic, Teratosphere was causing more severe damage to that plantation than eucalypt rust. You can see where that climatically lines up. It's just south of Sydney. What we're seeing now that we've got eucalypt rust established in Australia, we've, and it's pretty much spread right throughout the range we're seeing along the eastern seaboard. In Victoria, where it's been established since 2011, hasn't spread out from the um, very susceptible exotics in gardens into the native communities. Um, it doesn't start doing that until you get north of about that line. So south of that line, conditions aren't conducive to get into the native communities. Um, I've got the last, before I get a rugby tackle. <laughs> I just wanted to recap on the <coughs> what this is all about. So I wanted to conclude by saying it is possible, we can manage our, we have, we can and we have managed our main pest threats effectively and it's shown that it's economically viable to do so. Um, going back to our first slide, severe damage can occur and this is an example of that but the consequences in the main part of our climate envelope the plantation is pretty well buffered it's only when you get to the periphery of our climate envelope around the edges when you start to get onto drier sites if you've got the wrong species so cold. this is nightens on the sites that are too dry for it this is after it um teratosphere eucalypti chiromyces epidemic in 2011 killed a lot of plantations in that sort of central drier parts, of northern central parts of Tasmania where it's a bit dry, a bit, a bit the dry end of the range for nightens. <coughs> I think the really important thing from my perspective that pest and disease management will continue to evolve. So as new threats appear, we've seen eucalypt rust come onto this day. As the plantation estate changes, the age class, I think we've largely um, established the areas we're going to plant in, Australia, in Tasmania but the products will change, the species might change, so there's a big evaluation, a re evaluation of the species ongoing. And refinements are made to address suboptimal management. I'll show you an example of that with our leaf beetle one. So we need to maintain the core expertise. So I guess part of my role from here on in, I'm leaving Forestry Tasmania in two months' time and I'm going to be a, uh, the ne next generation of consultants. So if you see next time you invite an Australian over here and it's a younger person, you'll know I've succeeded. If it's me, I won't. Thank you.